Om det känns roligt att välkomna er tillbaka så känns det alldeles fantastiskt att få göra det med en så älskad, hyllad, genial och angelägen författare som Jamaica Kincaid. Ursäkta. Jag har en känsla av att de flesta av er redan har en relation till hennes verk och också känner till hennes biografi. Hur hon är född och uppvuxen på Antigua och som 16-åring skickades som au pair till New York. Sedan hon debuterade i början av 80-talet så har hon på ett alldeles eget sätt behandlat ämnen som kolonialism, postkolonialism, moderskap, familjerelationer och trädgårdsodling. Ett eget sätt som har byggt en alldeles särskild plats i hjärtat hos både kritiker och en väldigt bred läsekrets. I Sverige har hennes författarskap de senaste åren fått en renässans tack vare förlaget Tranan och översättare Niklas Nilsson. Och både Niklas och Tranan är här ikväll så vi passar på att rikta ett tack till er för den insatsen. Vi kommer ikväll att få höra Jamaica Kincaid samtal med Rakel Shukri. Och med det sagt så vill jag egentligen säga Dear Jamaica, I hope you feel most welcome to Malmö and please the stage is all yours. Welcome. Should I sit there? No? Okay. You have a right position now from the audience. Is it okay? Uh, uh, yeah. uh, wherever. Right or left, doesn't matter. Uh, <laughs> um. Dear Jamaica Kincaid, it feels great to welcome you to, to Malmö. How does it feel to be here? Oh, um, well, I keep thinking that somewhere there's a murder and there'll be a detective <laughs> um, and um, I might be crucial to solving it. This, this is because, I say this because um, uh, I tend to watch... Um, okay. Oh, is it all right now? Okay. Um... Uh, I like to watch these dramas of um, other places, and um, there's a lot of uh, detective... Um, uh, I subscribe to a channel that just has all these detective um, series, and something is always happening in Malmö. <laughs> yeah. And there's driving around, and, uh, and and mainly I watch them because they're, um, these series are other places I've watched. Um, hours and hours of Turkish soap operas. <laughs> um, hours and hours. I've, I've just started in. Uh, I just finished watching a long series of uh, soap opera that takes place in Bahrain. It was really interesting. Oh. Uh, you, you, you know so that I I I grew up with uh, watching Turkish uh, movies because my parents were born in 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 Turkey, and it really traumatized me. Because there were never any happy endings. That's true. Yeah, somebody is somebody is always killed, and there's always a scene where the girl's mother calls her whore and slaps her. But ah, that I've seen that. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yes. Um, well, there was one I had to give up watching because it, it was exactly that. Um, it had no ending uh, of a just kind. That the bad person was always. Mm getting away with being a bad person and it was a mm. and was just, and and I thought oh I can't watch this yeah. anymore but it, so, but it's um, very funny that you watch uh, nordic noir because here here in in uh, in Sweden a lot of people are fascinated because we don't have the kind of serial killers that you have in the US but but the, we have a lot of serial killers in fiction yes. and I don't know if we are perverted in a way that we we want yes, to be um, well it's funny. They have a lot of um, murders in the English countryside. That's another kind of uh, thing that I like. <laughs> I, lo I like to watch. But um, so I'm never going to the English countryside. Yeah. It's, just, yeah. it's just clear that uh, if you want to die, you go to. Yeah. 
Yeah. yeah, and then there'll be somebody who comes and... Hmm, yeah, and but, but you no. can feel safe here in, in, in Malmö. Malmö. It's yeah. Pride Week and we are so glad to have you oh, here. Oh, that's why all the... Oh, yeah. I saw all the rainbow flags and I thought, wow, they've really gone crazy. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, so it's Pride Week, well, but so but uh, but I'm going to send you some clips uh, later on from Fox News because they have been in Malmo as well, and their description of of Malmo is uh, it's like Babylon. So really, yeah. But but I'll send you, you the links afterwards. Yeah, you all watch Fox News. <laughs> I so never, I don't even know it exists, it's sort of yeah. crazy, yeah. it's a crazy world. But, may, but maybe because Sweden is such a small country that when somebody mentions us, oh, we, you we, quickly we, we have to, <gasps> Fox News is talking about us. So, and even Trump talked about us. He Ooh. said last night in Sweden, have you heard what happened last night in Sweden? And actually nothing had happened in the but whole country. See, that's, that's so... <laughs> interesting um, that you even mentioned Trump. I sort of don't even think about him uh, <laughs> anymore, um, but yeah. I'm sure I'll send him a, a bouquet of plastic flowers in jail. When he goes to jail, yeah. I'll send him some plastic. It was a horrible yeah. uh, experience for a, uh, some of us. Even the people, I think, um, who supported him or who wanted him to win or whatever it was, yeah. they never looked happy. You know, no, I've never seen a happy Trump supporter. And actually, I've never seen a happy right-wing person. Mm. No, no matter what, the entire Supreme Court is now right-wing. Mm. The government is right-wing. Oh, they've gerrymandered the whole country so that always it will be Republican. They're still not happy. Why mm. is it that right-wing people are not happy? There's a thesis. Somebody... <laughs> uh, the unhappiness of the right. They're never happy. Did you ever see a picture of Third Reich people happy? I never saw a picture of <laughs> the Goebbels family enjoying Christmas no. or whatever it is. But you, but you mentioned flowers. You're going to send uh, oh, flowers, plas right. plastic flowers to yes. Trump when he goes to jail, inshallah. Yes. And um, <laughs> <laughs> that leads me into your, your latest book that is translated to Swedish, my garden book. And actually I went to a restaurant the other day and I had it with me and the chef, the chef said, oh, I love that book. Um, was he a good chef? She, yeah, yes. the, 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 the food was excellent. Oh, good. Excellent, yeah. Oh, good. Um, but my garden book, uh, which uh, Niklas translated beautifully to, to Swedish, it's filled with um, sharp essays and uh, humoristic essays about gardening, about flowers, about why you prefer gardening catalogs without pictures. Oh, yes. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but yes. but it's also um, uh, the themes of your fictional work also runs through the, the book. Um, but but I would like to start with asking you, why is the garden so important for you? Well, it became important. I didn't know that it would be. It wasn't something I I sought out. It's um, uh, like. Um, you know, going for a walk and you take a certain path and you take a certain path and then you go somewhere. It was really um, like that. I, as I think I mentioned in the book, um, as a joke, uh, a kind of funny thing for my first Mother's Day, uh, my daughter's father gave me um, packets of seed and um, some gardening tools that were not the, they were from the kind of bad store, but they it was were just they were cheap. They were yes, I yeah. Didn't. It was a cheap gift. Okay. <laughs> yes, um, uh, but not to um, because he also did give me a a pair of uh, gold earrings. Um, but the baby, uh, the woman who who helped me with my daughter, um, stole them, and I knew she stole them, but I didn't have the heart to let her know that I. I knew, so I uh, forgot about the earrings and uh, proceeded with the gardening tools and the seeds. And um, 
dug up, uh, planted them, nothing happened. And, uh, and I didn't know this about myself at the time, but nothing is more um, uh, tempting to me than failure. Nothing is more, if I fail at something, I just keep doing it. Uh, and um, until uh, I don't want to do it anymore, and it doesn't matter whether it's a if I ever become successful at it, I just, I just do it. So um, nothing happened. Um, and then we moved from that house and uh, went to another house where the intro, the sort of, oh, someone gave me, the person who bought the house with gave me some uh, peonies um, called Festiva Maxima. I don't know if you have them here. It's very old. And at the time she gave them to me, they were 50 years old. And I've now had, have them for only, I've now had them for only over 30 years. And um, so I planted those. But I had also paid someone uh, to level the yard and, uh, and plant new grass. And that spring, these red things begin to sprout up in the grass. And so I got very upset and said, you know, I paid you all this money. Look at what's, uh, it didn't work. Mm -hmm. And uh, my neighbor said, yeah, you know, I think uh, Mrs. McGovern, who lived in that house before me, had a peony garden there. And that's how I learned that that's what, how peonies come up. So there was that. And then... I started to do uh, uh, more and more, um, but then not maybe a year or two into li uh, two years into living in that house, um, I found the house I, I lived in, and without knowing anything about it, I've always would run by this house, and uh, without knowing anything about it, I said to the person I, I would run with, another mother, we had children the same age I said oh you know I just love that house I've always wanted to live in it and she said oh I think Mr. Uh, Dr. Woodworth just died I bet you his children will sell the house want to sell the house and they did uh, and I bought it but I didn't know that Dr. Woodworth the the owner of this house not only had built it but that he himself was a botanist and had been involved in the development of time-lapse photography and uh, the plants in, uh, that I met were plants he had used but none of this um, really penetrated uh, my consciousness or me determined um, anything um, about me. But I should tell you, uh, I am the sort of person who really um, mostly live in my um, unconscious or sub not, mm. I don't know, subconscious, um, whatever. But I live in my head a lot. A, a psychiatrist once asked me to draw a picture pictures of my family and I drew everyone with a full body and uh, I drew myself last and I did the head and then I said to her, um, oh, you know, I can't draw, I can't do this anymore. And she said, well, do you notice anything about this picture? And I said, I'm so sorry, I'm not good at drawing. And she said, you don't have a body. <laughs> <laughs> and so this is just to tell you that I live in my head yeah. uh, a lot, but without really knowing it. Um, I'm not conscious of oh. it. Uh, uh, so all of this, when I uh, moved into this house of Dr. W uh, Woodworth, um, I, I started to garden in this m uh, mad way, and it made uh, my family uh, very upset, but I just ignored them and pretend it wasn't happening. Uh, um, they almost became jealous, I think. Because I don't you think almost they uh, became jealous. Yes, we yeah. just leave out the almost yeah. <laughs> um, uh, because it just took up so much of the not only my time but the household budget. Mm. You know, I was just <laughs> uh, um, and I became obsessed with catalogues and I I learned uh, Latin. Mm. Oh, I I actually promised one of my friends that I would never learn the Latin names, but I did, and I never told her. <laughs> and yeah. she shortly died, so she doesn't yeah. know. Yeah. <laughs> um, but, and the, so, but so gardening, uh, I always think a writer should have a hobby mm. or something you do when you're not writing, because 
uh, if you're not writing all the time, and American writers write all the time because they think writing is a career, and it's really not. Uh, a but, career. But talking about uh, Latin names, um, uh, somebody that pops up a lot in your essays yes. is uh, Carl von Linné. Um, How do you say it? Carl, Carl von Linné. Von Linné. Von Linné, okay. yeah. And mm. it, it feels like you have maybe not that complicated, of, you have somewhat of a complicated relationship Uh, with him, and I know that uh, th there has been a lot of controversy surrounding Carl oh, yeah. von Linnea. Yeah. Uh, and uh, last year there was this uh, petition in, in Stockholm. Two thousand people signed the petition, wanted the statue of Carl von Linnea in Stockholm removed. Oh. But, but how, how is your relationship with well, <laughs> Carl von Linnea? Uh, it's, um, <laughs> I mean, and I've read quite a bit about him. Uh, what is my relationship with him? Um, well, I should tell you that, for instance, you know, I have a bust, a, quite a large bust of Thomas Jefferson in my garden, and that's very controversial because, as you know, he owned people who looked mm. like me. But, um, and I do think every Confederate statue should not only be removed and not put in a museum, but should be thrown into the deepest part of the ocean and never seen again. Uh, but uh, there are some people that um, I have a, a way of, of describing them uh, uh, as on the other hand. Uh, and um, Linnaeus is, uh, um, is one of those. But, but also, um, Linnaeus didn't actually do anything. So he suggested that there were races and some were better and some were worse. Mm. Uh, not just suggested, actually, but he actually didn't put me on a slave ship. So, uh, you know, it's sort of like the debate about Christopher Columbus. Mm. Christopher Columbus actually didn't do anything to anybody. He went down and uh, he... Uh, Um, you know, you should read the, his journal, by the way, the first vo journal of the first voyage. It's really quite mm. fascinating, and it's where um, the modern world, in my opinion, begins. In, in, and there's a particular moment uh, where it begins. But Columbus, if, if you want to um, denounce and, and burn anyone in effigy, it should mm. be Isabella and Ferdinand, in whose name he did everything. He always said in the name of the king mm. uh, and, and queen of Spain. And I, so I don't know why people really pick on Columbus. Um, you know, in the end, uh, he was on his fourth, at the end of his fourth voyage, he was returned to Spain as a prisoner because he was such an unpleasant person um, <laughs> uh, that um, no one liked him. And he had to make a, a claim for... Um, Uh, I had to make a fuss about his claim because one of the things that uh, he was promised that his uh, legacy, his spoils would be passed on to his children. Mm. And of course, you know, I was in Genoa not too long ago and there isn't one statue to Christopher Columbus. Mm. There isn't even one street named Christopher Columbus. There's a little hut in the middle of town and, and people say he was born there. And then they quickly say, but you know, he came from the countryside and his parents were just shepherds. <laughs> Uh, nobody ever says he a, was a Jew and a, um, a trader of cloth. Mm. And, and so they, in Genoa, they don't really pay any attention. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So Linnea, to go back to Linnaeus, um, uh, I, I think uh, uh, I admire... I admire what he did with plants. I... Um, I don't like that he dressed up as a Laplander and pretended mm. he was a Laplander. It's called appropriation nowadays, I think. Um, but yeah, I, I, do, I, I think it's y useful to separate things, but only for me. I, you know, you can do what you like, but I sort of can separate things. And um, I think on the whole, if I were making you know, dividing the hall into the good people and the mm. bad people. I would put Linnaeus in the good people mm. side. I wouldn't uh, 
even consider Columbus, I would put Isabella and Ferdinand on the bad people's mm. side. Yeah. Um, you know, the day Columbus left but, for the new world mm. is the day the Inquisition began. Mm. So that tells you a lot about them mm. and what would happen eventually in the world, um, in Germany, eventually in Germany in the 1930s. People don't think that they're... Um, is any uh, you know a connection but there really is a connection between packing sli people on a ship and taking them to their deaths uh, across the Atlantic mm. and packing people on a train and taking them somewhere to have them be ashes there mm. is a connection mm. um, but and Europeans don't like to make this connection at all um, you, you like to think you're innocent of this you have just looking on on it. I, I, I mentioned it uh, when we spoke uh, earlier that I went to the Canaries and, yes. and went to a museum there and they had this small, small sign where it said, there used to be a native people here, but now they disappeared. They're yes. extinct. I, and, and, th and that was it. Yeah, I so, never... And, and a lot of Swedish uh, and other European people go to the Canaries every summer and during wintertime as well, have a great time. Nobody talks about the native people who well, used to live there. Until you said that, I never understood in uh, Columbus journals when he first meets the uh, people living in the Bahamas and, uh, and Haiti and Jamaica and so on. He keeps saying that they they resemble the people in the Canar uh, Canaries, and uh, or, or they're darker, or their hair is almost like. And I often thought that they were just Spanish people. I didn't realize that they were uh, mm. uh, probably um, what we'd call... Um, indigenous. Indigenous, yeah. Yeah. that's the word, yeah. indigenous people. So, so I'm very grateful um, to you for pointing that out. And now I have to go uh, and look. look cause I'm always wondering how people got where they are. Mm. You know, well, we know how Africans got there. We know how, uh, but I've never known how Greenland got um, indigenous people. I've never known how Alaska got uh, uh, mm. got indigenous people. And my mother, who was part Carib Indian, which is what the Caribbean is named after, um, I don't know how they got there. Mm. But but people will say, oh, the Bering Straits, and that seems to be a good explanation. Though no Native American will accept that they are um, migrants. Mm. They rarely believe that they come up uh, out of the earth. <laughs> you talked earlier about the the bad people who are putting um, Africans on, on boats um, and um, talking about the uh, some of the Europeans, British people. Um, in, in your garden book, um, um, uh, there's a lot of um, uh, critical remarks about the British oh, and how they... Critical? They, <laughs> rightfully, mm -hmm. rightfully critical. And um, you write somewhere that um, they don't like foreigners and that's why they, they love all the foreign flowers because that's something foreign that uh, they can love. Oh, that's a true. Yeah. But, but, but when I read your, your book and, and the critique of um, uh, the British Empire runs through your fictional works and when you were born in Antigua, it was a British colony. Yes. Um, and I just wanted to ask you uh, this frenzy now around the Netflix show uh, The Crown. For me, it's, it's, it's kind of disgusting in a way that people are enjoying this uh, very expensive production about the, about the royal house. And also in the, the last season, mm -hmm. they're almost trying to depict the queen as she was the one who was taking, uh, fighting uh, for freedom during apartheid South Africa. Yeah. Are you watching The Crown? Of course <laughs> I'm watching The Crown. Yeah. I mean, I had a, my school notebook, um, all of us, our little notebooks that we took our, um, had on it. And so if you were in a certain, the higher up you in, in school you went, the more notebooks you had. And every one of the notebooks had on the cover a picture of Queen Elizabeth and her now 
decayed, deceased husband who looked dead before he actually died. And uh, um, nothing wrong with that. Uh, <laughs> but um, uh, so, of course, it would it, it would run through my fiction. I used to know the line of kings who um, occupied the English crown, and it's full of blood and murder and deceit and lies and so on. And um, I, I, I don't. I, I think if you wish the crown wasn't made that the royal family would probably agree with you because they don't look good in it and mm. I, I I think that the reason people um, watch it is sort of like watching um, a movie about Clark Gable and Vivian Lee or something it's not as if it's not that they want I, at least I don't think mm. um, Americans uh, want a, a king and queen what Americans like are celebrities and they treat the royal family um, like celebrities mm. uh, not like people who could actually rule over you yeah. or who would but, you would admire but, but my way of seeing it is that after brexit which i know that you love you loved brexit. yes i do because <laughs> it's going to destroy them <laughs> I just more. love it. <laughs> <laughs> Very they, much. I was hoping the Scots would be independent, but they failed me. But then Brexit. <laughs> yes. But the, but the crown is a way of them getting attention because not, they're not getting so much attention. You write in one of your books that in the gardening book that they used to rule a fourth of the earth and people were adoring them. And what do they have now? But but tell us how is Brexit going to destroy? <laughs> Oh, you haven't read the papers? They, um, I mean, how will it destroy them? Let me see. Is it better to trade with um, Sweden or tiny islands in the Pacific? Which would it would be better to do? Would it be better to um, do things with the people across the channel mm. or people who are at the other end of the earth? Mm. How would it destroy them? It already... Uh, is they were always a very narrow-minded uh, and um, enclosed people. And now I make generalizations uh, that if you were to make such generalizations against black people, I would walk out. But let me make generalizations about <laughs> um, these people who, uh, you know, really just uh, destroyed um, large parts of... Uh, of people's lives and it's sort of interesting to see that they to me to see that these people who went everywhere and turned their p other people's worlds upside down were upset that people were coming into their world mm. and turning it upside down i mean it's just the way and i mean you suffer from this too but it's just the way of human beings every you know everything you read uh, about any society it's just says oh well this group of people came out of africa then or they came out of this uh, I, I just read something that um most filipinos had the or oh, most people in the philippines had the dna uh, a marker of some people called the devonians and they're these um small uh dark people and uh, and from that i learned that um uh, things that are uh, um, indigenous to small islands are smaller. I learned that because, of course, you would have to con mm. conserve your resources so you don't grow like uh, tall Norwegians. Um, you know, people are always going somewhere. We are taller in Sweden, I wanted to say, but no. Well, <laughs> there you go. Yes, Sorry. You Nordic people. Yeah. Um, <laughs> No, but it's it's. Um, why do I? I I don't. It, so much of me is formed by mm. um, British culture. Mm. You know, I um, I love Wordsworth. I love Milton. Mm. I love Shakespeare. Everybody loves Shakespeare. Mm. But um, but then I remember in the novel uh, Lucy, uh, an amazing novel. Who? How many have read Lucy? Yes. Mm. Um, the, uh, uh, she mentions that in, she never singed, uh, sung, sung, sing, sung. How is it? S um, is it? Is it? Sang? Rule Britannia. Sang. Yeah. yeah. She never 
she never sang Rule Britann- Britannia. Yeah. And I yeah. wanted to ask you, is that from your life? Were you the one? Oh, that, yes, yeah. yes, <laughs> yes. A lot of Lucy uh, it, it is from my, my life. Um, Rule Britannia, and I may have gotten that idea of despising it from my mother who was very political oh. um politically active and politically aware um uh you know and i, I mean it, it, it was a very um talk about double consciousness that we colonial people um had because we had an allegiance uh to england uh that was practically nationalistic but we also understood that we could never be english mm. um so this uh you know um i've i've said this uh but i'll just say to you um afresh for instance almost every church had i, I don't know if you have this tradition in christian churches here but um there's a closing hymn where you clo- the last hymn you sing um in the service and it's usually a kind of you know goodbye see you next week um hymn and invariably the, the hymn um we had to sing um was about seeing the white cliffs of dover <laughs> In Antigua. In Antigua. And oh. it's not just in the Antigua. In the Caribbean. In the Caribbean. Not, yeah. We weren't allowed to go to England, never mm. mind seeing the white clothes of Dover. So imagine having, uh, um, you know, uh, concretized in your imagination something you not only would never, will never see, but would never be allowed to see. It's not like heaven, you know. So in fact, a photograph a, a, a painting of the english countryside was often presented to us um on sundays in sunday school as heaven as a photo, a photo of the a painting of the english countryside so you know we just grew up with this um really distorted uh a view mm. of of everything of the cloud. for instance at christmas we'd have fake snow and so i never liked christmas because it wasn't there was no snow i mean clearly christmas takes place in a, in a place with snow mm. but we didn't have snow um we didn't have spring and we were always uh uh talking about spring which we never had and not to mention this thing called how i spent my summer holidays we were always in summer you know if it was december it was summer if it was august it was summer so what summer holidays um, was that so we had, you know this mixed up um uh imagination which some of us escaped um a few of us escaped derek walcott escaped it and and made um really wonderful things are uh, out of it um i don't know that i es- escaped mm. it i mean once i told him what i I'd done with daffodils yeah. that I hated daffodils and uh, post postclelior in Swedish. Ah. Yeah. Um because I had to memorize the Wordsworth poem. Well, you've read the book. Uh um and then uh at some point when I became a gardener and so this has been another one of the useful um ideas gardening has introduced to me is redemption. Mm. So at one point I I decided but wait a minute Wordsworth would have been a, opposed to his poem being used in that way um as an oppressive tool in colonial uh a, a weapon in colonialism um and apart from that the very daffodil itself was innocent mm. um of the place it had been put in 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 my life and so i proceeded to plant um 10,000 daffodils it's now 20,000 um because every year i mm. add some but i felt i wanted to redeem yeah. wordsworth and the daffodil mm. and i do that with a lot of things you know there's a lot of but, a lot but, of things but i just want to mention that in 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 the novel lucy uh when she sees daffodils that's right she she feels sick yes uh, and at first she, she doesn't well, understand why it's the first why. time she's yeah. seen a daffodil and yeah. she's like, that's the flower i've been yeah. uh but but yeah. but uh, have you also redeemed the uh, cotton because you write about it in in, in your book because the most brutal connection 
There is. It's funny you say that. I grow cotton every year, and I even grow a black-leaved cotton, mm. which is, I think, very transgressive. Because it's um, it's interesting because there's this uh, artist uh, from the south of Sweden. His name is Timbuktu, and uh, Timbuktu, Timbuktu. I can't I can't switch between Swedish and English apparently, but uh, his his father is African American, mm -hmm. and Timbuktu, Jason Diakitia, he wrote he went to the south to uh, find out about his roots uh, and see the plantage where his um, ancestors had been slaves. Mm -hmm. And uh, he brought with him uh, a piece of cotton he to brought it back, back to, to Sweden. Yeah. And his father uh, was furious. Really? He was Yeah, and he, he compared it to his son going to a concentration camp and bringing oh. something with him. But, so, but, yeah. but even cotton can be redeemed well i try every year and you know i never really have success with it first of all it's vermont and the season is very short mm. uh for cotton but almost invariably my cotton fails and i feel as if there is something in it that uh, that as a black person i'm not allowed to grow cotton voluntarily mm. um but i do try uh, uh to grow it mm. um uh, in fact, this year I had such a failure uh, out of four packs of seeds, which would be 20, I think it's 10 uh, per pack, so that would be 40 seedlings. Only four survived. Mm. Um, I have better luck with some... Divine intervention, maybe, no. <laughs> I know, but but they, yes, cotton is something that must be redeemed. Uh, in fact, I have... A huge bouquet of dried cotton mm. uh, in my in both houses um, I live in. Yes, uh, I've now graduated to one of those Americans with two houses um, and two houses, not a little thing in the woods. Proper houses, um, not in the same city, in different cities. No, two in different cities. Good. One in Cambridge, Massachusetts. <laughs> one in uh, North Bennington, yeah. Vermont. But. Um, uh, no, I, I think cotton is one of those uh, uh, absolutely uh, uh, things. Cotton is an interesting uh, plant because it's, it, it's ne always in places near the equator. Mm. Uh, so people who live near the equator um, have clothing, uh, easy uh, cl uh, clothing. I, I always find that so interesting. It's one of the things uh, Columbus met, you know, was this plant um i i think it's called um barbadensis because it comes from that part of the world mm. and there's a different kind of cotton in egypt and and so on but it's the the plants uh, uh it's not the plants it's the uses to which uh we have put them to you know that is the that is the violation mm. Um, you know, tea is just a nice little camellia, camellia sinensis. There was no reason to put it in plantations and enslave people in the plantations in the East or rubber, all these things that um, people found, uh, uh, Europeans, I should say, found and, and uh you know, put them to use. I, th I think, you know, everything, but especially true in America, everything in America we find, we think, well, how can I use this? Mm. Um, you know, you can look at, um, I was talk talking earlier about this, uh, um, oil. Well, people found oil and uh, shortly after they found a use for it, the motor car. Um, yeah, everything we find. And someone was telling me that there's a Native American um, story of uh, them harvesting rice, wild rice, and uh, they harvest it in a way so that a lot of it falls into, half of it falls into the uh, water. And um, uh, a European person uh, reaping it with them said, oh, but you know, I know a very efficient way uh, to do this. And the Native American said, but I'm not the only one who needs rice, mm. or I'm not the only one who is hungry, or something like that. But this is something 
yeah, mm. we are not the only ones. We don't have to have everything. Mm. Can you have some of uh, uh, some of it? I mean, rice is another thing that has but been. I'm sorry for interrupting you. No, not I'm at all. Sorry. Yeah, ah. because uh, I was just looking at the watch and and uh, just remembered that we also have to. I also I wanted to ask you about your your female characters. Um, Are there th male characters? Oh yes, my, my <laughs> there is some male characters as well. Um, but in 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 several of your books, uh, there are girls or, or women who are the main characters. Yes, and. Um, Uh, uh, Lucy is one of them. Uh, Annie Hall is another novel. The no, uh, Annie John. Annie, Annie John. <laughs> oh, oh, sorry. Annie. No, no. Um, and I shouldn't have said that. Uh, It's good you did yes. because now I'm ashamed. Annie oh, Hall. Oh no. The book is called Annie Hall. <laughs> <laughs> Don't. Please. Annie John. There's This nothing to be ashamed Annie of. John. Yeah. Nothing. And there's also the autobiography of of my mother, but. Um, Um, and and the critics and the readers uh, have appreciated your characters who are very strong, impressive. They are sometimes uh, shocking. But uh, what struck me uh, when when reading your novels is that the girls and the women in your books are strong and vulnerable at the same time. Um, and it struck me that in a lot of uh, in in many books and in a lot of fiction, more people emphasize the vulnerability of girls. Huh. But you, on the other hand, emphasize that they are 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 strong. Um, is that is that balance important for you? Uh, I didn't know there um, was a balance again. Um, <laughs> it's a, you know, I have this theory that a writer have to know everything and at the same time know nothing. Mm. Um, and how you, uh, Christina, you, you know this, how you maneuver um, this, how you travel through this land of knowing mm. everything and knowing nothing is one of the most exciting things about writing. Mm. Um, you know, how to uh, not step on a mine. Um, mm. What is it? Uh, one of those mines that look like, you know, landmine, how to, how to do it. Mm. Um, so, but I wouldn't have known that I was balancing um, uh, any, if it, the thing I do know that I balance consciously when I'm writing is the words in the sentence mm. and uh, the way the sentence will end um, is very important. It ends on the right. And sometimes it will take me mm. months mm. to finish a sentence because Not, but uh, but I'll no. give you an uh, I'll give you an example and m maybe clarify what I mean. Uh, when it comes to the autobiography of of my mother, um, uh, her her mother died during giving birth, birth. to her. That yeah. may leave her vulnerable. And the rest of her life, um, she keeps imagining, trying to see the face of her mother, but she can't. She can only see her see her heels. And it's something that she thinks about constantly. But on the other hand, um, she's strong, she's independent. Um, she, she, she's not relying on, on somebody else. So it feels like you were emphasizing her integrity or her strongness and not the vulnerability of, of um, uh, her mother dying in, in childbirth and living with a stepmother that really tried to kill her. <laughs> In the book, <laughs> um, well, but we are all mm. like that. Um, what is resilience? Someone to told me about the that there are actually is something called a resilient gene, mm. and um, I think that um, it's. Um, I, I hadn't ever really uh, thought about this before, this resilience, but uh, I, I think it's one of the things um, that uh, that the characters I, I, mm. I write about without really knowing, um, without ever really being conscious of it, I incorporate um, that in their character. And, I, and, and since, you know, I'm writing primarily about two people, my mother and myself. Mm. 
you know, I, I must, and my mother was uh, very destructive to herself mm. and yet very resilient, mm. um, you know, and uh, not interested in shame at all. Um, not interested in, de in, in denying, she would just uh, go on. So I think, you know, that sentence, um, you know, my mother died and mm. uh, um, it was a sentence that I, I think I must have had in my head before I even knew mm. I, I would write at all uh, because it um, seemed to me such a truth about my mother's life and later, as she had me, um, I felt that about my life too, that uh, the moment I was born, she died. Mm. Um, you know, I was her In first... In what way? Uh, well, let me tell you. So I was her... She, I think I was, she was 35 when I was born. Mm. Um, for a woman in that culture, it's very late to have your first child. And then later I, um, through uh, something, she, I, I said to her, someone had, uh, had nine children and looked at how sprightly the person was. And she said, well, I've had nine children too. And I thought, well, there's my three brothers and me, so there's four of us. So that means there must be five children that she didn't allow into the world. And sure enough, it's true that I was the first uh, person, first child um, that wasn't, uh, the, the, the attempt to abort me was not successful. Mm. Um, that doesn't bother me at all. She I've tried? Oh, absolutely. She tried. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Mm. She, my brother... The you were last too strong as an infant. <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, she liked to say that too. She would say, you know, when you were born, you didn't cry. We had to mm. slap you. Mm. <laughs> and apparently I, I just uh, refused to cry. Mm. And it, but I think, yeah, they want you to cry when you're born so your lungs expand. Or that's what they say. Um, but I wouldn't. Uh, wouldn't cry, but uh, so in that in this way, when I was born, she died. Um, well, her life then, as she wanted to live it, she couldn't live it. She had a child, and she uh, was very um, uh, wonderful to me. She taught me to read very early on. By the time I was three and a half years of age, I could read anything. Mm. Um, she encouraged my intelligence, and then she tried to destroy mm. it. Uh, so, as mothers do. <laughs> mm. I'm kidding, I'm kidding. Yeah. No, I mm. don't think I, I have done that. I don't mm. think so. But I, I often would compare her to um, the god Cronus, you know, who gives birth in the morning and eats his children at night. Uh, that was my mother. Mm. Um, so... To go back to vulnerability, you know, I'm writing about when when I write about women, I'm writing about these two characters mm. in one way uh, or, or the other. I draw on them, and um, it's it's quite all right with me to see uh, a woman like my mother try to control mm. her life, and that um, I'm I'm glad uh, I was one of her failures. But I think uh, she. Knew that I was one of her failures, and uh, for uh, in regard to her personal life, mm. um, her life changed when I was born, and her life changed when the others were born. And in fact, the last child she had, whom she tried to abort, my mm. brother, um, uh, my life changed when he was born. His uh, the arrival of of him in in our life um, made us poor in a way we had never been mm. and that was how I got sent away to America to earn a living so you know um, yeah uh, resilience and uh, vulnerability um, uh, I, I wouldn't have said that I was trying to carve characters mm. um, like that but it's very much a part of my conscious unconscious mm. that that's what a a female character is, mm. uh, yeah. yeah. But there's a, um, 
It's interesting because what a lot of people or some people, when they write about this theme, they say that, well, this is also a way for Jamaica Kincaid to, she compares the mother-child relationship uh, is symbolic for the relationship between uh, Antigua and, and the and history. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that yeah. is also yeah. Um, true and not at all... Uh, um, um, it, shouldn't, it shouldn't be a mystery or even a, a, a surprise, you know, the... Uh, I came to understand early on that the child is the weakest person yeah. in the world, um, even in the most ideal, wonderful family, because a child has, uh, you know, you're a child. Mm. You depend on people to feed you, clothe you, change your mm. diapers, and uh, someone to guide you through the world uh, morally. You don't, you don't understand anything. Mm. Uh, um, but it's also but interesting. No, wait, I was, I was going to say so. You know, you you are powerless, and uh, then you have this uh, powerful person, mm. um, an adult. Mm. Um, well, their behavior, uh, they understand power through, and and work through power through um, the situation they know, which is a colonial empire. Mm. Uh, uh, of power. So often, you know, in school, our teachers behaved, treated us the way we were treated uh, by the colonial uh, empire. Of course, they in turn were treated um, badly. So it's just one of the, you know, one of those things that you, you, um, yeah, it is, it, it's, it's not a surprise that my, a book like Annie John could mm. easily be read as um, mother country mm. colony. Yeah, yeah, easily. But it, it, but it's also interesting that uh, uh, something that also occurs in several books uh, or stories, like the short story Girl. Yes. And also in Annie John, not Annie Hall, um, <laughs> is when the mother tells the daughter, don't become a slut. Yes. And that's also recurring, don't become a slut. Yes. And I think I saw a talk with you uh, on YouTube where, uh, with really? a New Yorker or something, where you said, well, maybe, maybe I should have become more of a... Maybe I shouldn't have listened to my mother. I should become more of a slut, <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, I do regret uh, not becoming... <laughs> Uh, I slut when I was younger because now it's too late. Yeah. Um, yes. Uh, I, I don't. What What is a a, 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 a woman who has uh, sex with anybody she likes, mostly mm. men? Um, I don't think you're called a slut if you sleep with a lot of. If a woman, you're a woman and you sleep with other women, maybe that's changed. I don't know. Mm. Anyway. Um, but certainly, you know, the idea that uh, you would be um, forbidden mm. um, t uh, to have sex, you know, which never really even occurred to me. Um, but the more I was told I was going to become a, a, a slut, the more it seemed an interesting thing. But, of course... <laughs> Uh, luckily for me, no one seemed interested in going along with mm. the sluttishness that I <laughs> so desired. But you did live in New York in the 60s. Yes, uh, in the late 60s. Late 60s, yes. Yeah. And, uh, and, and tried very yeah. <laughs> um, hard then to become a slut. But uh, um, it is true that I um, I wanted an education, um, so I didn't. Uh, I became a slut later on, and then <laughs> I got married and brought an end to that. Yeah. <laughs> um, but talking about um, New York, where where you lived um, in the sixties, um, the shirt that you are wearing. Oh, yes, uh, yes. All the words of Eric Garner, who was yes, killed by yes. police. Um, what does that stand for you? I can't... Oh, yeah. well, uh, you know, I... He was the first person recorded as saying, I can't breathe, when a policeman sat on... Um, choked him. Mm. And um, uh, a year after it happened, I thought people didn't talk about him anymore and I was afraid he would be forgotten. So um, I found these T-shirts in different 
block letters, um, some is in script, some is just like this. And I bought them uh, because I was afraid he would be forgotten. I didn't realize that it would become a fashion to sit on a black man's uh, neck until he died. Um, but that's why uh, I wear, it's very comfortable and I sort of forget myself. I did, also didn't think you would know what it means um, in Sweden, mm. but apparently um, you do. Because someone was telling me that some awful right-wing man wrote an editorial in one of your newspapers. Oh no, that was in Denmark. Um, yeah. Um, They're always worse. They <laughs> yeah. But we have our problems here as well. <laughs> but but the person, the Danish man was talking about wokeness mm. and cancel culture. And um, so I said, um, but does he realize that woke originates in African-American culture? It's African-Americans who first started to tell each other mm. about woke. And then for some reason, it just slid into right-wing um, Fox News kind of mm. culture. And then the, th uh, uh, the thing about cancel culture really is a black thing. Um, and black people never use it anymore. But it's very American, you know. I didn't know it would, like rock and roll, it would catch on mm. in the world. It's very American to take African-American things and... Um, embrace them and then kill the African American. Mm -hmm. Now that's just America. Well, same thing with the mm. indigenous people. But but when it comes to the 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 states, um, it it's also interesting that there is a movement that goes in two separate directions right now. In one way, you have the Black Lives Matter who are raising consciousness. You have you see several uh, athletes. Are kneeling, uh, and New York Times uh, had again. Co Colin Kaepernick was the uh, um, I mean, uh, was the first uh, person to do it. He was much maligned. He had to, he lost his career. Yeah, yeah. Now everybody yeah. um, does it. Just, yeah. uh, but yeah. there's this uh, there's this great backlash. I mean. Uh, also now against raising consciousness. I mean, yes, uh, the critical the race theory. Yeah, yeah, critical race theory. There are some Republicans who wants to ban they, schools. They have no idea what they're yeah, talking about. Yeah. It's, um, so, so I mean, uh, things are getting better and worse at the same time in the U.S. Why is that? <laughs> well, yeah, um, I guess I would disagree with you about things mm. getting... Uh, better and worse. I think it's just things the same, but slightly adjusted angle, mm. you know. Um, uh, white Americans have always not wanted black people to vote. Mm. Um, I don't know if you know this, but Hitler was very interested in American racial laws, um, in American racial arrangements, and drew on it heavily mm. for his own ideas. Uh, there was a man, uh, Madison Grant, I think was his name, who wrote a book called um, something about the Nordic race, that it was disappearing. News to you, perhaps, um, that you were disappearing. And um, it was an, a bestseller worldwide, well, worldwide, mm. a bestseller in Europe, and Hitler wrote him a fan note, a fan letter. Um, so America, racialism, ra racial ideas in your world comes from America. So we've always had, I mean, with the um, uh, uh, emancipation mm. um, of slavery, and, and it's a very interesting idea to emancipate. It's different from abolish, but I'll... That's a whole other conversation. American sl um, slaves were emancipated, but slavery itself was not abolished. Mm. Uh, anyway, 
um, so after the slaves were emancipated, they were then treated in a way that was um, despicable. Mm. So uh, the eman uh, emancipation of slavery, um, that was done. But something else took its place. It was a different angle uh, uh, from which to see mm. black people. And so this is another angle. In the meantime, just voraciously consuming everything African Americans produce, mm. including the their land language, their style. I mean, um, rap is uh, just so African-American. Mm. Um, I remember a senator's wife and uh, two senators' wives, Tipper Gore and another uh, person uh, testifying uh, about uh, white children being exposed to rap music and its vulgarity and so on. You can turn on the television any moment and see an advertisement accompanied by rap music. It's uh, just an American thing to mm. hate black people but take their things. Mm. As it was mm. an American thing to uh, kill indigenous people but keep their names. Um, mm. I was saying earlier that of the 50 states, 26 of them are the names of Native Americans. 50 states, but 26, more than half, are named after Native Americans. The Native Americans are no longer there. There are no Arkansas, mm. um, Arizona, Michigan, mm. Connecticut. I don't think there are any Connecticut uh, Native Americans, but there's a state called Connecticut. Mm. America is very, um, it's on a new, it's on a, a level that you all don't even begin to understand. But I sometimes think Europeans don't even begin to understand uh, their participation in this world of, you know. Um, yeah, I'm trying not to hurt your feelings because you're so kind. <laughs> to leave your comfortable homes yeah. and come and hear yeah. me. And so I don't want to s berate you for, you know, so I'm... But yeah. uh, it's, I, I remember when I was in uh, New Orleans, uh, in, in, um, no, outside of New Orleans, in Louisiana, and I, there was this uh, former slave plantation, which uh, is now turned into a museum. Yes, I and, know. Uh, I, With I, the spikes head on the, yeah. Yeah. But when I, but I, went, when I went there, because I was interested on, like, what are, gonna, what are they going to say about slavery? But they mo ma ma mainly talked about, well, you know, this plantation was uh, driven by women. All the, man all the bosses were women, so this was like a progressive. So we almost had to, and we were a couple of Swedes there and said, but, and what about the slaves? Really? You have that, it? Yeah, yeah, but it I was visit, almost... That's interesting. They must have been doing that for you. Because I visited, if it's the same plant, Whitney, the Whitney Plantation? No, I think it was called after the, the women, but, it, but it's, huh. it's only an example of how, uh, yeah. how like, uh, um, like when they acknowledge history in, a, in such a twisted way that they, and also want to make, make money of it. But, but I know that we are running out of time, so I would just like to ask you, what, what gives you hope now? Should we ha end on a happy uh, note? What gives a, no, you hope? I never end on a happy note. What, uh, <laughs> what gives um, you mo the most, gives me the biggest headache? I don't oh. want to end on a happy note. I'm not. It's not that I'm unhappy, um, but I, I, I think happiness is, uh, you know, it's one of those, and this is a really big problem in America because we are supposed to be the pursuit of happiness. Mm. Um, and and so Americans are always pursuing happiness, which means denying other people um, their turn. But um, what gives me hope? I don't particularly have uh, any hope or any not hope. Um, I think, uh, I mean, this is how bad things are. I'm so happy uh, to be here. It's been a year and a half since I've gone uh, anywhere. Mm. So that it gives me hope that um, maybe the coronavirus <laughs> will go away. <laughs> that makes me um, happy to, or to think of a, a future without uh, such a restriction. So I can go back to being unhappy about... Um, 
uh, a textbook that says the Af Africans migrated to America. That's a new, the opposite oh. of critical race it theory is a right-wing <laughs> textbook that says that uh, um, Africans migrated to the United States. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I, it would be all right if they said Africans migrated to the United States forcibly. Mm. That would make sense. Yeah. That would make sense. Yeah. Um, they, would be forced, they were forcibly put on ships and, mm. and, uh, and packed like sardines. Um, yeah. Uh, so, you know, nothing makes me um, uh, happy or unhappy. I have a granddaughter and that makes me very yeah. happy. Yeah. Um, and, let's see if, and let's see if Joe Biden can make you happy. You, you, I'm very pleased with Joe you Biden. Are, yeah. Yes, I mean, he's never... Not as uh, he's never going to propose a society like yours, but he's not anti union, he's not a he hateful person, mm. he doesn't make me get up in the morning and just think, Oh, I wonder what the president did now. <laughs> um, you know, I don't think he's a criminal in, in any uh, well, of course, if you were living in a little house in Yemen and a plain, uh, Drove Drills, just yeah, blew yeah, you up. Yeah. Uh, you might not feel so positive about Joe Biden, but all things considered, um, he has a couple of yeah. years to become a criminal. Let's see what happens. Well, <laughs> all all people with power eventually are criminals. Yeah. Um, and uh, not to disregard uh, uh, power, um, but it's a dangerous thing. Yeah. Um, to be Jam handled with care. Jamaica Kincaid, professor, you made us very happy tonight. Thank you for Thank you giving very us the much uh, the for your kind, your kindness coming here. Thank you. <laughs> oh my goodness! Bye. Thank you so much, Jamaica. Thank you, Rocky. We're most grateful that you came to Malmö, that you make us think wider and deeper. I, I can tell you, I don't have a garden, but when Linnaeus writes about my hometown, he writes about the hat fashion there, actually. He writes about what? The hat Hats. fashion. He did? Yes. So. Yes, he was very fashionable, you know, dressing up like a <laughs> Laplander and taking mm. um, and making an image of himself. It was very fashionable. We don't have a gift for you. Instead, we have donated a small sum to the support fund of David Isak, who is a Swedish journalist who next month has been in prison without a trial for 20 years in Eritrea. And a small bag with his face and oh, name on it. Oh, that's who that's in Eritrea. Thank you, Thank you so much. Yeah. <laughs>